And unfortunately, I do not have to, uh, well, exchange good news with you, because what we face right now, uh, the European stability mechanism uh, is uh, something that, if it follows the European politicians, the next and the next and the next generation will pay. So, um, with all due respect to Professor Emmerich and to uh, people who have witnessed what happened after uh, or during the World Wars, uh, do we face the most expensive peace project now? And who will pay for that? So this is something that we have to consider, and what is the future of Europe? And I would like to discuss this with you and start out with an experiment of thought. Kind of all Europeans are equally the same, well, but do we have, don't we have diversity? First thing. Second, Europe as the diversity thing. Now, they're combating the crisis by ESM European Plus packet, bailout of Greece 1.0, bailout of Greece point, uh, 2.0, bailout of Greece, which is ESM 3.0. When will we have bailout of Europe 4.0? I just asked this question. And then, of course, the solution and the vision of the future, uh, which we, as uh, libertarians and people who defend free markets, have to uh, approach and have to look at. So to start out with Adam Smith, I mean, what is prudence in the conduct of every private family? Can scarce be folly in that of a great kingdom? And it can scarce be folly in that of a nation state, of a sovereign nation state, and it can scarce be folly in the European Union. So we just have to reconsider the facts and think of that. Um, where do we stand in Europe? Where does this all fit in? Where is Europe on the global map? The new G7 is definitely not France, Britain, Germany, the Americas, Japan, <coughs> India, China. No. The new G7 definitely is Europe, as put it together, not a union maybe, but maybe as a, as, a, as a concept of thought, as we see, with competing regions. But they, but this Europe is competing with China, with India, with the US, Japan, Russia, and Brazil. And of course we have new countries emerging, and who will run for competition with us. What we have faced, and uh, all the other speakers at the previous panels have pointed it out, and Dan Mitchell has brought it to you with his eloquency, as you all know, uh, we have faced creeping socialism in Europe. Just to give you evidence, in this uh, sources are from IMF and OECD, so nobody can tell, well, this is just the bad new liberals, uh, libertarians, <coughs> who claim the facts and figures. So this is the source of government spending in percent of GDP, starting out in 1870 until 2009. And if you look at the average, I'm not going through the, uh, the numbers, but if you look at Austria, what we had by that time 30 million inhabitants, now we have 8.5 million. By then it was 10.5, now it's, well, current figures is almost 60 percent. Uh, the average of Europe, or average in the world, is now, it is close to 50%. I mean, where does this lead to? So I don't, want, I don't need to repeat myself, um, or repeat the other speakers, but these are the facts and figures given. So what do we face? We face politicians who try to survive and to be re-elected and not making any decisions. Because of course things hurt. Things hurt if you want to change stuff. But this has not happened in Europe. We just bought time. We bought time. And the money was literally printed. It was easy money and it's a taxpayer's money that is being redistributed. Just to not solve the problem because homeworks have not been done in, in neither of the countries. So who deserves the blame? We have heard about the recession, we've heard about the financial crisis, we've heard about all the bubbles, the housing bubbles starting on, etc., etc. So, but the hidden liabilities of the welfare states are the da most dangerous things. One thing that Lady Thatcher pointed out, eventually they run out of other people's money. This is what we will face in Europe. 
The question is just, will we face it in 2013? Or will we face it in 2015? Or will it just be 10 years' time? So this is the point. Another thing, of course, we all know the history about the, uh, the, uh, the pigs' countries and the imbalances that we faced. Just to give you an example, a Greek and a harbor worker in Athens had a productivity of, say, 40%. He had to compete with, a, or his company had to compete with a harbor worker in Hamburg having a productivity of close to 98%. So how does this fit in? How does this match? Again, Europe is diverse, as I pointed out at the very beginning. If you just look at the holidays, the amount of holidays, the legal holidays, the differences are from 11 days in, in, in the Netherlands to four days in Romania. The number of working hours, uh, Finland with uh, 47.5 uh, hours per week down to 30 hours uh, in our southern countries in Europe. So where does this match? It can't. It can't work. You can't put it all into one basket. But this is what, uh, what has been tried. This uh, from uh, the Chicago Tribune from 1934 literally shows what is going on in Europe right now. It has been going on in the past 60 years, at least in Western Europe. Um, we, have, we have created those huge welfare states. We have redistributed uh, taxpayers' money. And this did not work then. Hoover Roosevelt failed. And, it, and we fail now in Europe. So what is the solution? A free society actually is a form of social organization that works best. And it provides growth and prosperity. We all know that. We have it has been proven. These are where the good old these were the good times when Lady Thatcher or Ronald Reagan uh, were in power and when the age of hype actually started, when market reforms were put into practice, when countries grew by themselves, when uh, when tasks of, of governments were reduced. And remember, the most important question that we need to ask ourselves nowadays, in these days, is what is the task of government? What do they have to do? What do we pay them for? And can those things be done more efficient, more effective by private enterprises, by businesses, by other solutions? Well, this is the summary, kind of the Europe, the European crisis and the Euro crisis. I mean, the Euro as a monopolistic and unsound money, I think this is clear to everybody by now. Uh, the expansive uh, monetary policy, the printing of the money, uh, this is what we have been facing recent, all the time. If you have a look at the number of the sovereign debt levels, how they grew, but note, not due to the financial crisis because, for example, uh, politicians claimed to have to um, do some um, Keynesian policies in terms of saving businesses, etc., etc. All they did was expanding the welfare state. We know big government has big problems. So, what has happened in the past two years, especially, or actually in the past three years? The violation of the Commission against the no bailout clause of the Lisbon Treaty. Facts. Note, we have had the rules and regulations in our contracts, but they were broken by our politicians. And now they claim to reinvent the wheel or put new rules and regulations or impose them on other governments, on new governments, and they will break them again. If you follow what I will show you later on, this is clear. So the commission infringed the prohibition of the purchase of debt securities. We all know that, the article of 123, which is actually very easy to remember. And we all know that this did not work out. So the problem, as I pointed out earlier, is the lack of uh, competition in Europe. It's the differences of unit labor costs. It's uh, 
the problem of the export performance within the countries. The change in the current uh, account balances of some countries are negative, of course, we all know that. This has been uh, shown prior. What has happened? The first rescue package in 2010, 1.0, I call it this way. These are the numbers, just quickly. Um, just these are the, the, the fiscal burdens of that, that we had to pay for that. To give you an idea back, 2010, April, how fast this grew? 110 billion, this was a, uh, by, the, by the Spiegel, so it is in German, I'm sorry, but I, it's just have to show you what, how quickly they changed. April 2010, 110 billion. In May 2010, it was 750 to all the other countries who were, who were in, need, in need. I mean, this is something, this is a quotation. And by then, this is from April, uh, from, from uh, 2010 June, uh, June, by then they thought they will, it, 620 billion will be enough for the European stability mechanism. We all now, we all know now that we are at 800 billion plus, plus, plus. So the naivete of this was uh, clear. Here we have the, uh, the countries that had problems already then in 2010. Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, Spain. So what do we face with the, uh, with the European stability mechanism? It does not solve the problem. Neither does the ESM nor the EPP. Because they do not update with the policy makers. And the trouble is, those politicians who decide what measures have to be taken also are the ones who go for the money. So actually last year, 23rd of March, was the official date when we became the transfer union, the debt and transfer union, due to the breaking of all the rules that we have imposed, or that we have actually put together. So the trouble, again, that I pointed out is um, there are no private creditors that are held responsible. And by then, the first ESM, remember this was when the Greek bailout two was discussed, uh, we thought about 500 billion, so they would be sufficient last year. These are just figures to remind you where we stand with the mastery criteria, 60% or rather the 3%. <coughs> Greece bailout two, rescue package, EFSF, which is now or became the change to the ESM. So the problems with the new rules, they will not prevent violations. It's all political bargaining. The early warning system doesn't work, which is most important. And uh, there is no, no knowledge of uh, what will happen in the markets. So this is what we face right now, as of April 2012 the ESM, which, remember, from one day to the other, Merkel and Sarkozy changed from 700 billion to 800 billion. And it's a European uh, taxpayer who will pay the burden. But in the end, nobody will care. And this is the question of responsibility. The question of responsibility that we have to ask not only to our local politicians, but we will also have to send the message across. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Quickly, another reminder. Freedom responsibility and social responsibility. And trust me, as a Hayekian, uh, I'm just quoting Horst Köhler, one of the former presidents, uh, a president of, of the German Republic, when he said self-interest in the 21st century is to care for one another, without government intervention, without having everything paid by governments. So this is what we are having now in Brussels, central planning. And this thing is just what I wanted to let you know. As for 1st of January 2013, we know that we need this amount of money, which is 300 billion for current deficits of the EU member states, Italy will need 460 billion, France 
um, refinancing of 365 billion, Spain 215, Greece 85, Portugal 33, and Ireland 12. If you add this up, this makes more than 800 billion, which is now precluded for the ESM. So this is why we are the crash course. The transfer payments of the EFSF strengthen the current crisis by reducing the pressure of the reform. Of course, because we're just redistributing. There are always some, some stupid taxpayers who will pay for it, whether it's the Germans or the Austrians or you, uh, or you here in Slovakia. The crash course can only come to an end if free markets and real structural reforms will be put into practice. This is how we can solve the, uh, the crisis. And after all, a Europe of competing regions and not a centrally governed Europe will be the solution for a free and a responsible uh, Europe and uh, where we have the rule of law imposed and not uh, threatened all the time. Okay, I want to keep it like that. And uh, again, I want to encourage you, fight the ESM because the bailout 4.0 We'll be earlier, we'll be here and I'll chat with you. Then we will discuss this latest by September this year. Thank you.